Welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. And, of course, in the studio with me today, in the glorious Student of the Gun Radio studios, is Jared Markle. Jared, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I've got my gun sight coffee cup, and I'm good to go. Jared's got his gun sight coffee cup. I have my Monster Rehab Tea, and uh, I'll give him a free one. Thanks, Monster. Maybe the guys from Monster will be listening to this, and they'll be like, man, Paul Markle drinks Rehab Tea. We need to, we need to send him a case of it. So. <laughs> this is the the rojo tea. That's right. We're drinking the rojo tea today. Now, uh, last week, now don't forget, guys. Last week we announced our crossbreed holster giveaway contest, and uh, we're going to do five holsters for five weeks. Now, last week we announced it, and the way that you uh, can sign up or be eligible is just go to studentofthegun dot com. Sign up on our homepage. Well, we've got our first winner. That's right. And uh, Mr. Mike Gallup of Omaha, Nebraska, is the first winner in the Crossbreed Holsters giveaway. So Mike is going to get himself a Super Tuck Deluxe of his choice. He can choose it from their catalog. And don't forget, you got four more weeks, and all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, sign up for our weekly newsletter right there on the uh, main page, and you will be eligible. Now, our friends at Keltec weapons down in Cocoa, Florida. They're working hard. They're working as hard as they possibly can to crank out KSGs and PMR 30s and all that good stuff for you guys down there. And if you want to check them out, it's easy. You just go to keltechweapons.com. Now, uh, our good friends at the Firearms Radio Network, they brought us on board the network. They gave us the opportunity to come out and reach uh, you guys. And, uh, Jared, if you missed it, I, I think it's still up. Jared was a guest on the Fat to Fit radio program last week. And even though it might not be currently the new show as you're listening to this, it will be in the archives. So if you want to listen to Jared talk about fitness and MMA and choking people into unconsciousness, you can go over and you can check Check out Fat to Fit Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. Now, don't forget, every single week, because we like you guys and we like to have your input, we do Student of the Week. We do a Student of the Week. And uh, what we found is uh, some of our Students of the Week have uh, asked us if they could get the book instead. Do you know that, Jared? I, th- I threw him a curveball. He's not ready to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, well, you do now. Yeah, actually, a, a couple of our guys they said, well, I already bought a shirt. Uh, can I get the book? And I was like, sure. So what we've been doing is a, a few of the, the folks, the students of the week, we've sent them an autographed copy of the book, Student of the Gun, A Beginner Wants a Student for Life. But Jared is going to tell us who our student of the week is this week. Take it away, Jared. Our student of the week this week is Mike Hoagland, and he wants to know about everyday carry ammo. He wants to know when you should change it, and can you swap it out for older ammo or not? Uh, Good question, Mike. Yes, Uh, EDC ammo. EDC, I I like how that term in the last five years has just kind of popped up, but when I was a police officer, we simply referred to it as duty ammo. And uh, the duty ammunition should be, if you buy quality ammunition... It should be good for a long time. It should serve you well. But humidity, if you carry, especially if you carry concealed and you carry your gun in close proximity to your body all day long, you go in and out of the heat, in and out of the air conditioning, it's exposed to humidity and temperature and what have you. And even though it it may be good on the inside, especially if you're using standard brass ammunition, uh, I'll give you a quick hint. If you open up your gun and your brass is green, it's probably a good time to change it out. Now, we're joking a little bit there, but actually, if your brass turns from a brass color to a brown color, uh, it's probably a good time to change it out. If you live in the South like I do, if you live in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, Texas, what have you, uh, you're better off if you're going to buy duty ammunition. I would always buy the the nickel cased ammunition, especially if it's going to be uh, a lot of guys out there carry revolvers and uh, this with speed strips and what have you. You drop a a speed strip of standard brass ammunition in your pocket every day for two, three, four months. You pull it out. It's all going to be brown. So you might want to spend the extra couple of dollars to buy the nickel cased ammunition because nickel cases are obviously more resistant to corrosion and heat and so forth. 
and and the the effects of the weather. But as to your point, what we would do when I was a police officer, we would do annual qualifications. And the first thing you would do is we'd step up and we would run the first two, three, maybe four drills, depending, uh, with our duty ammunition, with what we had on us. We'd shoot up the duty ammunition, and then at the end of the course, when it was all over again, they would break out the uh, the sergeant in charge would break out new ammunition. We'd load up with new ammunition, and we'd go from there. Uh, so that when I was a cop, I would make a, a deliberate purpose of changing it out annually, uh, at least once a year. And a lot of you guys, if you're new to carrying, uh, if you're new to concealed carry, you think, wow, a year, that's really not all that long. Uh, but you don't, what you don't want to do is buy it and just leave it in there forever, <laughs> uh, or forget about it. And, you know, people are like, well, you know, duty ammunition. I had one guy actually say, you know, that stuff's expensive. I just can't be shooting it up. Well, compared to, yeah, it's expensive compared to buying a cup of coffee or, you know, a cheeseburger, but it's pretty cheap compared to your life. Uh, another good friend of mine likes to say, uh, ammo is cheap. Life is expensive. You know, don't go cheap when it comes to ammunition. And don't, don't, uh, one, one of the, the reason that came up actually is because people were, uh, searching around on the ground at the range for ammunition for a couple of pieces of ammo, or they're worried that about dropping ammo on the ground, you know, like, Oh, if I drop it on the ground, it'll get ruined. Like, dude, leave it down there. Ammo is cheap. Life is expensive. And if you're going to carry by, and, and there is a difference. We talked about this on the show before, but there is a difference between, you know, duty quality ammunition and practice ammo. If you're going to load your gun up, load it up with the stuff that's dedicated or that is manufactured specifically as duty ammunition, controlled expansion bullets, sealed primers, you know, uh, flash reducing powder, good, you know, high quality cases and so forth. Because you're only going to need, let's, you know, 20, 30 rounds max of duty ammunition to load your guns up and be ready to go. So, yeah, the, the answer to you is everyone has, you know, their own lives to live. And like I said, if you pull your gun out of your pocket or out of your holster and you look at the ammo and the cases are have gone from brass to brown and now they're starting to turn green, uh, get rid of that ammunition. Just shoot it up. Buy some new stuff. And the uh, <laughs> the good news about the current ammo crisis is even though we are in a quote unquote ammo crisis right now, the duty quality ammunition is because it is expensive, because it's not practice ammo, it's not training ammo, it's more readily available than full metal jacket, which, you know, seems in a logical world to be bizarre. But I guess if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because people are buying up all the training ammo. Uh, and when I buy ammo, if you're going to buy ammo for your duty gun, I would buy twice as much as you think you're going to need. Let's say you're, you're going to, uh, you got a Glock, a Glock 19, right? Two 15 round magazines. So rather than buy one 25 round box from Remington or what have you, or 20 round box, buy two 40 round box or, you know, two 20 round boxes or buy a box of 50 or what have you. Uh, that way you're not worried. You're not being stingy. You're not, Oh, if I lose one or if I, um, you know, I drop one or if I, I shoot one, it's not a big deal. Oh, also, this is a good time to talk about your, your, um, chambered round. Let's take a, a quick uh, a side turn and the round that is actually chambered. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, men, humans, we, especially new gun carriers, get this weird nervousness about having a loaded gun, about the gun actually being loaded, even though it was designed and built to be loaded. Believe it or not, that gun you've got was designed to be loaded. Jared? But if it's loaded and you've got one in the chamber, isn't that dangerous? Uh, no, Jared, that's, it's not dangerous. Actually, the firearm that you were, that you're carrying or that's on your bed stand or nightstand was designed to have a round in the chamber. It was purpose built to be loaded. But people, uh, especially new guys, new care or people that don't have any formal education. Well, I bought a gun and I own a gun. Uh, so I'm good. No, you're, you're not good. You need to get some education. But what they do is this is th they'll carry. And this is not so much with revolver people, but with uh, semi-automatic people, people who carry a semi-auto. Once they've convinced themselves to go ahead and carry a gun with a loaded chamber, they get home, you know, at night, 
they then they take their their concealed carry gun off and the first thing they do is they pull out the magazine and they rack the slide back and take that that round out and so now and then they might put the magazine back in with an empty chamber or some silliness like that but what happens is if you keep if you take the same cartridge of ammunition and you keep chambering it and unloading it chambering it unloading it chambering it unloading it what you will find eventually is that that bullet, that projectile, when you compare that round that you keep continuously chambering and unchambering, you compare it with a fresh cartridge and you'll notice that the projectile is starting to be pushed back a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. You get it pushed back in there too far and that first round will cause a malfunction. It will cause a stoppage. It's happened a lot. And a good friend of mine, uh, Ken Hackathorn, he hit me to a uh, a technique oh, a long time ago. I mean, probably 12, 15 years ago. Ken uh, said, if if you have to continuously chamber, you know, for whatever reason, you're going in and out of a, if it's a duty situation, if you're going in and out of a station where you have to clear your gun, or let's say uh, a lot of times when I was in, a, well, when you're in the Marine Corps, if you're in a situation where the guns that you're carrying have to be turned back into an armory you know, uh, regardless, he said, what you want is you want to take one magazine and make that your quote unquote loading magazine. The only thing that goes into that magazine is one single round. And what he want, he's what he recommended is the round that you're taking out of the chamber, put it in that loading magazine all by itself. And that way you can compare that round of ammunition to the fresh unchambered ammunition. And it'll be, it should be readily obvious to you whether or not the, it's either getting scarred, whether or not the uh, the case mouth is getting nicked or what have you, or if the projectile is starting to get pushed in. He said, if you get that situation, take that particular round and take it out, swap it out for a brand new one, and then take it, throw it in your practice box or your training box next time you're at the range, just put it in the practice cycle and shoot that thing up. The last thing you want with a duty pistol is for the first round to go bang and then the rest of them not work because you have an immediate stoppage. It's not how you want to start your gunfight. You don't want to start your gunfight with a stoppage. Now, the way that you uh, prevent that is to stop chambering and unchambering rounds all day long, all the time. What you do is you put your gun loaded in a holster on your body. And you carry it secured on your body all the time. And then when the end of the day comes and you have to take the gun off, you put it into, like I, we already talked about, I put mine into another holster. I have the uh, the bedside backup. So it goes directly from my hip into the bedside backup, which is essentially an identical holster to the one that I carry all day long. So I don't need to continuously chamber, unchamber, chamber, unchamber the rounds. Because over time... Uh, you know, taking one cartridge and continuously chambering it and unchambering it will damage it. It will it'll damage it, and it may damage it to the point where it causes a stoppage. So, uh, I know that you got more than your money's worth for there, Mike. But uh, my advice to you is, you know, every once in a while, set your own pattern: six months, year, what have you. But shoot up that duty ammo, shoot up the carry ammo, and replace it so you got fresh stuff. Remember, you are betting your life on the ammunition that you're carrying. So. What is your life worth? Is your life worth buying one brand new box of ammo each year? And if it's not, you're you're kidding yourself. You really are. Ah, the next question. <laughs> this one came uh, to us from Facebook. It wasn't so much a, well, it was kind of a question. Uh, one of our fans said, he goes, well, how do I know whether or not I'm living in free America? We throw that out a lot on this show. I talk about it on the TV show. Uh, and in the United States right now, I don't think if you're listening to the sound of my voice that I have to remind you that we are a nation divided. Uh, this nation was founded on states' rights, the rights of each individual state to determine how they live, how their people live, how they govern their people. And if you haven't gone, to, if you didn't go to public edu public school in what, the last 20 years or so, you may know that there's a certain thing called the Bill of Rights or the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. And what is number 10? What does the 10th one guarantee? That, that the uh, powers granted in the Constitution or enumerated 
or not granted specifically to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people, respectively. Now, I know that is a, I just slaughtered that quote, but that's pretty much what it means. The Tenth Amendment says basically that if the federal government is not granted specific powers and authorities by the U.S. Constitution, then those authorities default to the individual states and then from the states to the people. You are the boss. The way this nation was founded, I know you you look at yourself, you know, I don't feel like the boss. I don't feel like I'm in charge. No, no. The nation was founded so that the individual sovereign citizen, the lawful citizen of the state, is the one that's in charge. You are not supposed to be subservient to the government. You're not supposed to have to seek permission for the from the government to live your life. No, it's the opposite. But people say, well, how do I know if I live in a slave state or if I live in free America? And right now, ladies and gentlemen, in 2013, this nation, the United States of America, is being divided. It is purposely and very deliberately being divided back up to the same place we were back in the 1850s and the 1860s into slave states and free states. Only it is the opposite this time, whereas up in the north back in 1850, 1860, People in Pennsylvania and New York and New, you know, New Hampshire and what have, have you like to claim that they were the free states. Well, it's the exact opposite right now. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put this out for you. Do you have to ask permission from the government to purchase a firearm? Well, no, no, what do you mean, Paul? You know, I go in and I do the... Uh, the form 4473 and then they call it in and I'm like, no, I'm not talking about a 4473. I'm talking about, do you require, does the state you live in require you to get a permit to purchase a firearm? Do they require you to have a permit to purchase a handgun? Well, yeah, we have gun permits, but it's not hard. You just go and do this. No, no, stop yourself. Stop yourself. If you're living in a state where you think going out and applying for a pistol permit is no big deal, you, you're, you're in the pot and they're boiling you. You're in a slow boil. And look what happens when you give up your sovereignty a little bit at a time to be reasonable. Well, it's not that big of a deal. We'll just be reasonable. How did re- what happened to uh, reasonable in this uh, state of New York? The people up in New York have been reasonable. And look at them now. Now they're completely under siege. The free, the freedom loving people of the state of New York are under siege. Connecticut, same thing. Massachusetts, same thing. Colorado, they went off the charts because the whole, well, we'll just give up a little bit of our liberties so that we can seem reasonable. And where does that get you? If you have to get a permit from the state, to own a handgun or a rifle or a magazine or ammunition, that is tacit amount that seeks that means you're seeking permission. If you have to get permission from the state, it is not a right. You don't have to get permission to exercise your rights. I know that uh, right now in modern America or in modern times, uh, everything is a right. We have smokers' rights and we have gun rights and voters' rights and human rights and civil rights. And, well, when you start calling everything a right, what happens is nothing is a right. When everything is a right, nothing is a right. What you've done is you've taken something that 200 years ago, 100 years ago, was rather sacred, and you, you've you watered it down to the point where it's almost meaningless. People are continuously throwing out reproductive rights and sexual rights and, you know, all, all these things. They throw the word rights behind everything, and what that does is it deludes the term so that it becomes essentially meaningless. And what they've done, though, is... By calling everything a right, this is a right, that's a right, human rights, civil rights, reproductive rights, blah, blah, blah. What they do is they set up who as the arbiter of those rights. Well, the government. What they've done is they've set up a a situation where people claim everything that they want to do is their right. 
I want to, I have a right to drink Coca Cola and I have a right to drive a car. I have a right to do this, all these things. And if you tell me I can't or you try and interrupt my, you know, my desires, well, then the government has to come in and assert that or assert my rights for me. And that's not what rights are all about. In the, you know, the preamble of the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, all of their founding documents, you'll find uh, that they say that our, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Now, I know that I'm stepping on a lot of you public school guys' ears right now. You're like, what? Uh, I learned about Earth Day in school. I don't know about this whole inalienable rights thing. Inalienable right. Well, what is in? I mean, it's we've number one. We're losing the language if we haven't completely lost it already. We have people in the United States that don't understand the meaning of words. But uh, inalienable means that you are not allowed to take it away. Or the person that's currently occupying the governor's mansion or the White House or the chambers of the Senate or Congress can't just arbitrarily take those away. That's the whole purpose of rights. The perp- And whether you're an atheist or agnostic or Hebrew or Christian or what have you, here is the deal, Jack. If you do not believe in a higher power, you say, well, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist or whatever, and I don't believe that we have rights granted by our maker, by our creator, by God. You don't believe it. Okay, fantastic. But here is the problem with that dude and dudettes. If you do not believe in a creator, in a divine power, where do your rights come from? They come from me. Oh, no, no, no. Hang on. Hang on a second. If you don't believe in a higher power, because in the, you know, in, endowed by their creator in the founding documents, this is we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. You say, well, I don't believe in a creator. I think that, um, a retarded fish monkey, um, you know, had relations with another retarded fish monkey and eventually it became me. Okay. And that's your belief. That's what you believe. Well, then your rights really are arbitrary. Well, no, they're not. No, no, no. Yes, they are. They're arbitrary. That means whoever comes along to occupy the seat of government at that moment, whether it is a king or a, you know, a dictator, uh, a president, a governor, a congressman, whatever, whoever occupies the current seat of government at that moment in time, whatever their whims or wills are, that is the rights that you have. If you don't believe that your rights were endowed to you by a creator, then your rights are arbitrary. They're meaningless. And I know that a lot of my listeners, my uh, my enlightened listeners who think that they're smarter than a creator could possibly be, uh, you're, you might be bunged up right now, but too bad. You need to be bunged up. But you also need to be thinking about stuff like that. You know, those of you who think that uh, that you don't need to believe in a creator, rock on. That's your right as an American. Now, in certain countries, they take you out and they cut your head off for refusing to believe the state-mandated faith. Keep that in mind. All of you who think that uh, we need to be reasonable and tolerant, we are the most reasonable and tolerant people on planet Earth. Most countries, if you speak out against the state mandated religion or the state or the state itself, you end up in jail, hung or have your head cut off. Keep that in mind. But uh, we live in a nation right now that is being divided from free states into slave states. And if you live in a state that tells you, citizen, you cannot be trusted with a firearm that holds more than 10 rounds or seven rounds or five rounds, or you cannot be trusted with a, uh, a rifle or a pistol that looks a certain way or functions a certain way. It's all semantics. Or if they say you are forbidden to own a certain type of firearm, but the state and the representatives of the state are allowed to own those because they should have them. You have to ask yourself, scratch your head for a second and say, well, hang on. So me, this, and this goes back to the citizen is supposed to be the boss. The citizen is supposed to be in charge. 
When you get to a point where the government tells the citizen that the citizen is not trustworthy, but only the state is, and only the state can have certain types of firearms, weapons, only the state can possess the sword, and the peasant is forbidden to possess the sword. If the peasant is forbidden to possess the the sword, he is not in charge. You are not the boss. You are a serf. You are a servant to the state. The moment that the state dictates to you and tells you that you cannot be trusted with a sword, and I know you're like, oh, I don't want a sword, Paul. I want a gun. Look, stick with me, bud. Dude, (laughs) stick with me. Uh, Throughout the entire history of this world, if you... If you go back and you study human history, natural history, back to Japan, we talked about it before, but I'll reiterate it a little bit. The first thing the state has always done in order to secure control over the peasantry is to disarm the peasantry. It wasn't, this didn't come about with the invention of gunpowder. It was going on long before the invention of gunpowder and firearms and flintlocks and cap locks and cartridges and all that. Go back to the 1300s, the 1200s, the 1000s, and you will find government agencies, you will find the state in a position where they forbid the peasants from owning lances and spears and swords and crossbows and bows and what have you, because why? Because only the state can possess those, because if we allow the peasantry to be armed, then the peasantry might not pay their taxes and be good little slaves like we want them to be. So keep that in mind. Now, A follow-up question we had is from uh, one of our fans or some of our fans in occupied territory who currently live in slave states. And uh, the question was, well, I'm forbidden to own an AR-15 or a black rifle or a self-loading rifle, what have you. What is a good alternative? Well, those of you who have been listening to the show for a long time know what my first recommendation is going to be. Be a free man. Load your family up. Put all your possessions in a rider or a U-Haul. I don't really recommend U-Haul. What's a good one, Jared? Penske. Penske. There we go. Load all your, your worldly possessions up in a Penske truck and drive yourself into free America and stop paying all of your tax money to a slave state that wants to enslave you. You could use that tax money and you could probably buy a trailer for yourself and you wouldn't even have to rent a Penske truck then. Yeah. Or, you know, just use some of that uh, slave state tax money. If you live in the in the slave state, the People's Republic of California, look at your uh, annual tax rate and think about how many trucks you could rent with the tax money you're paying to that state. And remember this, if you live in a slave state and pay taxes there, the the state is using your money to pass new regulations, hire new bureaucrats to enslave you. Isn't that great? There's no, oh, I talk about a scheme. Talk about a scheme. I'm going to get the slaves to give me their money so that I can enslave them further. Go team California. That's just as bad as in Massachusetts, New Jersey as well. But okay, for whatever reason, you don't want to leave the slave state. You want to live there because the weather's nice. Okay, great. Congratulations. What can you do? What can you do to defend yourself? Well, you can purchase things like lever action rifles. You can get a thirty thirty lever action cowboy gun because apparently uh, right now the uh, the slave masters aren't offended by them because they look antiquated. You can get a slide action rifle like those from Remington. You can get an over under shotgun. That's that's Joe Biden's favorite. What I would do if I was in a, a situation where I could not have a self loading firearm like an AR fifteen or an AK or what have you. I would have probably a couple of different guns. Let's say you're worried about home invasion because let's face it, if you live in a slave state, criminals have more rights than citizens do. So you're worried about home invasion. Well, if I was down to just having an over under shotgun, I would have multiple over under shotguns. I would have one in the corner of each room that I, that I occupied. Uh, And let's think about this, though. If you're talking about home defense and you're worried about home invasion, where is the best place to secure your handgun? Where's the best place to secure your handgun, Jared? On your person. On your body. And you're saying, what are you saying, Paul? Are you are you telling me that I should carry a gun on myself even when I'm in my own home? Uh, Yes. 
That's exactly what I'm saying. Because think about it. Where is the most secure place for it to be? Attached to you. If you're in the middle, if it's the middle of the day and you're going about your business, doing your laundry or, or what have you, and you hear smash, smash, break, hear the glass bus and, you know, three crackheads just booted your front door, uh, you don't have a whole lot of time. Do you want to play the where's my gun right now game or let me run upstairs? Well, maybe running upstairs means running by the three crack addicts that just broke through your front door. If it's on you, go team and you can fight your way to a long gun. But uh, keep and also keep this in mind, all the you who think the compromisers, the great, you know, life is full of compromises and you've compromised. You, I've got friends that live in California and, uh, you know, some of them are cops, so they kind of get around the law. Uh, by being cops or members of the state, but I have others that aren't and they still live there and they're like, oh, you don't understand, Paul, my wife loves it here or the the weather is awesome or, or whatever. And so you've made a compromise and life is full of compromises. But know this, don't expect if you live in a slave state and you have to use a firearm to save your own life, to rescue yourself or your family, don't accept the, expect the state to give you laurels and hero ribbons. They're not. They're already against you. They already think gun owners are bad people. And when you use a gun to shoot down that poor Democrat voter, oops, did I say that? Okay, we're going to leave it in there. So when you use your gun to shoot down that poor crack-addicted Democrat voter, they're not going to give you a hero's ribbon, okay? Expect to be prosecuted. Uh, it's just the way of the world. Uh, you put yourself in that position, and that's what you have. You know, that's what you run into. So the world is full of compromises, and you know, you might not like to hear it, but sometimes the truth hurts. It it does. Maybe now is a good time for you to start working up your escape plan. Come up with a twelve month escape plan. Ah, uh, moving on. Now, this next story, the next story we've got for you guys, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, have heard it. You may have heard about it because it gained national attention. And it was just it within the last few weeks. But a teacher, a Kansas a teacher from the, uh, I'm not sure what city it is. And let me look it up right here on my super cool ninja monitor that you guys can't see. His name was Dan Nagel, and Dan Nagel is a teacher at a high school in Kansas. Well, here was Dan's crime. After uh, the Sandy Hook debacle, after that went down, Dan started carrying a gun to school. Well, somebody saw the gun. Somebody in the school found out about it, and they, they dimed him out. And the school administration, from the stories that we have, the school administrators called the police and they came and they arrested him and he's lost his job. Well, right now there, he did a, uh, he gave a, a, basically an explanation or a talk. He gave a speech as to why he did what he did. And we listened to it this week. We're going to put the link up for you guys. Don't remember, uh, if you're, after you listen to this or while you're listening to it, what have you, if, if you're like, well, where did Paul get that information or where are they pulling that stuff? Are they just pulling it out of the rear ends? No, we're not just pulling it out of our rear ends. We actually, you know, do fact check things occasionally. And we do, we do a good job. And Jared puts some material up. So we'll put the link up for you. But uh, if you listen to Dan Nagel's, if you listen to his speech, and it's about five minutes online, a little bit too long to just let it run here on the on the show. But he says, essentially, he did what he did because he understands that shiny placards cannot stop evil people with guns, people that have evil intentions and want to do harm to your children are not going to be stopped by a shiny plastic sign that says no firearms allowed on property. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, and it's, it's insane that we have to even have this conversation. It's insane that there are adults that somehow found their way to being in charge in the United States that think the way to protect our children is to put shiny plastic signs on the front door. Oh, well, the shiny plastic sign. Well, why don't you just make the sign the size of the entire front door and write, oh, and by the way, you're not allowed to murder our children either. Because certainly, you know, when criminals and deranged maniacs see a plastic sign, that's all oh, they're going to stop and turn around and go somewhere else, right? 
oh, well, no, no, we understand that the signs don't help, but but it's 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 something. Oh, that's right. It's the whole we have to do something. And we're afraid of guns. We're hoplophobes. We, we're afraid of actual objects. We don't want to hold human beings responsible for their behavior. No, 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 no. And we certain, certainly cannot allow human beings to halt the bad behavior of other bad human beings. No, 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 no. No, in this, 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 uh, weird world, this twisted upside down world that we live in, we can just put up enough signs and that'll correct people's behavior. And so uh, I, the thing that disturbs me the most about this whole Kansas teacher thing is Dan Nagel. I, I was actually very, very impressed by the speech. I listened to it. I watched the whole thing and he came across as a very intelligent person, as a very caring person. But if you're a concealed carry person or a person who's thinking about carrying concealed or is new to the gun world, or even if you're not, uh, my big question is, if he was carrying concealed, how did anyone know about it? What did he do? Well, obviously, he wasn't concealed enough or he, he didn't conceal his firearm properly. If you're going to carry a handgun concealed, that's what it needs to be. It needs to be concealed. And his big mistake was not understanding or realizing how to properly conceal a firearm. That's pretty much it. Uh, and on a personal note, it really disturbs me that the, the, the way the situation deteriorated, that the, uh, the administration felt the need to, you know, call the police and have him arrested and removed from the school. You got what kind of weird maniac kind of people are these? Like, all right, first of all, I'm assuming that, that uh, Dan Nagel wasn't a substitute teacher that no one in the school had ever met before. I'm assuming that he was an employee, that he'd been hired, and he worked with these people every single day. Think about it like this. You work in a school. Let's say you work if you're a teacher. Uh, you, you, you go to the teacher's lounge with these people every single day, and or you're an administrator, and you find out that, or someone reports to you, they, they're like, I think, I think Mr. Nagel has a gun. What? Really? So rather than call Mr. Nagel into your office and say, look, somebody reported that they think you have a gun. I don't know if you do or not, but you know, it's a violation of the school policy. You can't do it. Get rid of it. If it's there, get rid of it, blah, blah. What kind of, like, we're in this paranoid, uh, Orwellian world now where we were convinced that everyone we're convinced that good guys are all potential bad guys. We're, we're being convinced by the news media, by the government that your neighbors, the people that, you know, the people you see every day, you can't trust those people. Those people might have guns. And if they have guns, they cannot be trusted. We're being taught. We're being that, and it's really if you if you if you know Orwell, if you're if you're a student of 1984 or Animal Farm or any of Orwell's work, that uh, we're being conditioned not to trust our neighbors. Uh, you know, New York after they passed the Safe Act, the, first, the right afterwards they passed the Dime Out Your Neighbor Act. If you think your neighbor owns an illegal gun, call this 800 number. What? They're more concerned about your neighbor might own an illegal magazine than they are about people dealing crack. Well, because people that deal crack are tough to, to deal with. They're tough to, uh, to work with. You know, they're actual career criminals. And, man, career criminals are a pain in the butt. It's much, much easier to corral the citizen who has a family and a career and a, and a reputation. It's much easier to deal with them. And we're... We're really, this is scary, but we're in a position now as a nation where the citizenry is being taught, is being conditioned to essentially fear their, the, the other citizen, to fear other citizens. Don't worry about the criminals because they're criminals are criminals and, and they vote Democrats. So they're good to go. Um, and they're, and they're hard to deal with. You know, they have lawyers and attorneys and they've been through the system and they know what the, what the deal is. But, um, if you think your neighbor, owns an illegal magazine, you need to call this 800 number and turn them in. And th folks, think about it. Think about your life in your own situation, where you work, where you live. 
Do you feel like you're being taught to fear your neighbors, not to fear criminals, not to fear terrorists, but to fear your neighbor because you don't know what your neighbor might be up to? So think about that for a little bit. And, uh, and make sure, you know, take, take a moment after you listen to the show to, to go find the video. It, it's the kwch.com video gallery. It says uh, Nagel's full speech, and we'll put the link up for you guys. Now, the next topic we want to talk about comes, again, from uh, the student of the gun mailbag. And it's about trigger weight or trigger pull. And this is one that gun people, this is something that we've been dealing with or talking about for a long, long time. And this goes back, oh, before I started carrying a gun. But uh, what, and, and, and then you have these, these uh, <laughs> phrases like lawyer trigger and hair trigger and match trigger and competition trigger and duty trigger and all these different triggers, right? And where does it come from? And basically the question is, is um, should I change out my trigger assembly to a lighter one um, that is smoother? Or if I do so, will I will it get me in trouble? Will I land in jail for swapping out triggers and, and so forth? Okay. This is what you need to understand about any modification that you make to a firearm. If you do it, if you either do it yourself or if you send your gun off to be modified in a custom shop or by your local gunsmith or what have you, uh, whether it's a SIG or a Smith or a Glock or Springfield or whatever, you've, the first thing you've done is you voided your warranty. Anytime you have anyone who wasn't the manufacturer work on your gun, you voided your warranty. And that's fine, but just understand that that's what you're doing. So if you take your, your Glock and you, and you have a ghost trigger put in it by your local gunsmith, and Glock is going to say, we're no longer liable for that gun. And that's legitimate. That's like buying a Chevy and swapping engines out, and then you crash and you try and sue Chevy. And Chevy's going to be like, no, that's not a factory engine. We don't know who you are. But uh, as far as liability is concerned, know this, understand this, and this is the, this was taught to me a long time ago, that if you're shooting, if you have to use your gun in, in defense, in a legitimate case of, tel- of self-defense, if the facts are are with you, what the the opposing attorneys will do, let's say it's a clear-cut case, at least in your mind, in your attorney's mind, of self-defense, of personal defense. Well, you have an opposing attorney who's not going to see things that way. If the facts are with you, they're going to attack things other than the facts. I'll give it to you a, a good example like this. Let's say you use your, you've got a Glock 19 and it has a 3.5 pound ghost trigger in it. And you're you're at home at night and a guy you know tries to smash in your front door and you yell stop stop and and he puts his arm through the door starts unlocking it and you and you shoot him and he dies on your porch and you say well i live in mississippi breaking into my house is a felony i'm allowed to use deadly force in defense against a felony i'm good to go right well you you run into a prosecuting attorney who's trying to make a career for himself and those guys are out there beware of them but you run into one and he decides he's going to go ahead and prosecute prosecute you for, you know, manslaughter or second-degree murder or something. You say, well, yeah, but the facts of the case support what I did. They support my actions. Well, what they're going to do, or let's say, let's take the prosecuting attorney out of it. Let's take the civil attorney. Because after you shoot a homo sapien, there are other homo sapien relatives that are going to come out of the woodwork and say that, that, Poor little uh, Johnny there that you just shot that was breaking into your house or trying to rob you in a parking lot of the Walmart. Poor little Johnny was a good little boy. And it wasn't until he was introduced to crack cocaine that he became a bad little boy. And it's not really his fault. And you should have known better than to shoot him down just for trying to rob you. And so you're you're liable for the life of little Johnny. And so you got one of these attorneys that has their face on the back of the phone book, and he's trying to to uh, get some money out of you from you and your insurance company. Well, what he's going to do, and even if the facts of the case are with you, you're trying to walk to your car, and a guy walks up to you with a knife and says, give me your wallet, and you smoke him. Okay, you did what you had to do. Well, he can't attack the facts of the case. So what he's going to do is he's going to attack you personally. He's going to attack your choice of gear. He's going to attack your choice of ammunition. Why did you feel the need to buy these super death killer, you know, Corbon Winchester federal 
Remington bullets. Why not? He's going to attack your choice of ammunition, and he's going to he's going to start picking away at things. And your attorney is going to have to keep knocking them down. Uh, they'll, they'll, your gun will probably be seized into evidence. And uh, they, if there's, they may or may not have the wherewithal to send it off to a, a lab or to an engineer and determine that it wasn't a factory trigger. And they're like, "Aha! You deliberately tried to make your gun more deadly by." putting in a lighter trigger. Now, here is how you defeat that, and it's very, very simple. And, and you just have to have a smart attorney, and you don't try and play your own attorney. You get an attorney, and you get your attorney to bring in an expert witness. And the expert witness will explain to this, that the discharging of a firearm is simple physics. In order to discharge a firearm accurately onto the target, to hit the target with the projectile, you need to do two things. You need to hold the firearm as still as humanly possible to align the sight with the target. The sight needs to be as still as humanly possible. The muzzle needs to be as still as humanly possible. But at the same time, you need to apply enough physical force or physical pressure to the trigger of the gun to make it discharge. Now, simple physics, the greater pressure or the larger amount, the more pressure you have to put onto the trigger in order to activate the gun to make it go bang, the more pressure you put on it, the more muscle tension, the more likely it is that the muzzle and the sights are going to shift or move off of the target. It's simple physics. So if you have a trigger, if you have a trigger on a pistol and it legitimately takes 15 pounds of pressure to press the trigger all the way to the back, make the gun go bang, you're going to have a greater movement in that gun than if you have a lighter trigger, obviously. So the truth is, if you have a competent attorney and you have a competent expert witness, they can convince the jury and the judge that, that actually having a lighter, smoother, better built trigger guarantees you or at least ensures that your shots will be more accurate, not less accurate. And that should demonstrate to them that you're concerned about where your projectiles go rather than just launching them all over the landscape, that you are very concerned about only putting the projectiles where they needed to be, which in this case happens to be into the bad guy. And that is not a bad thing. It's very simple, and even people with sixth grade education can understand that if you hold their hands and you walk them through it, because that's who's going to be on your that's who's going to be on your your jury is people with sixth grade educations with nothing else to do. So now the problem is, is you say, okay, well, great, I'm going to do that. I'm convinced. I, I should have a lighter trigger. Aha! But if it gets too light. Match triggers, competition triggers, and I hate the term because it's 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 like a Hollywood superfluous type garbage, but hair triggers, right? If you have a trigger that can legitimately release because it was bumped, going in, you know, bumped by an object, by clothing, by a, a, a holster strap, by something like that, if it only takes three ounces of weight or six ounces or eight ounces of weight to release the trigger, to press the trigger... That is too light, folks. It, it really is. It's legitimately too light. Now, most, I'm going to say most, but not all, most factory guns come with pretty good triggers. Uh, not all, but most. Now, the Glock trigger, let's talk about the Glock trigger for a second. I, I've shot a lot of different types of Glock pistols uh, through my life. The great thing about a Glock trigger is it is a it is a one-stage trigger or it is a single-press trigger. Unlike the older guns where you had a long double action and then it sets for a, for a single action, with a Glock or any other striker-fired pistol like the M&P 22, the M&P 9, the M&P 40, uh, the Ruger SR9, all those, they only have one trigger press for your finger to learn, and that is a good thing. That is a good thing. Now, what I have found with most of these, uh, the modern handguns, like your your striker fired guns that are that are uh, assembled on a, essentially just an assembly line, the the days of a master pistol smith sitting down and taking all the components together and putting them together, those days are over. What you'll find with Glocks and, and Smith and Wessons, especially the M and P nine. 
Uh, the more you shoot them, the better the trigger will feel. It'll, all the parts will start to work together because when those parts started out life, they were just a bunch of parts in little bins that they assembled and stuck together. They weren't working together as one cohesive unit. But then you shoot it two, three, four, five hundred times, a thousand times, and they start working together, and you'll find that it feels a lot better. If you have a trigger that came from the factory and it legitimately is 12, 14, 15 pounds, and I know those are out there, I really wouldn't use one of those for a, a carry gun because it's very heavy and it forces you to put more muscle tension on there. A, a trigger that's somewhere between five and seven pounds that is smooth, it's not all stacky and uh, should do you very, very well. But when it comes to modern guns, like I said, Smiths and Glocks and XDs and SR9s and so forth, most of the factory triggers are pretty good as is. Now that brings us to the end of part one of this segment. If you haven't figured it out yet, that's right. We're going to be expanding Student of the Gun Radio because everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of you guys out there said, Paul, your show ends too quickly. I need more. So this is going to take us to the end of part number one. Now, when we come back in the second hour, we're going to follow up on a previous story about the Colorado State Senate. We're going to talk about the well-meaning man, and then we're going to talk about open carry advice. 